this is Siobhan Moran, and this is Master Your Energy, Master Your Life. And energy is everything, and it affects our relationships. It affects our work relationships, our home relationships, our neighbor relationships, our relationships with people on the bus, on the train, in our cars. It affects our relationships with children. It affects relationships with every single relationship that we have and energy really does take a toll on our relationships and our mental energy about relationships is really key to how our relationships are completed they're upset or they're going to flourish and so one of the things that we're really excited to talk about today is something that's new and different and we're going to talk about energy in relationship to sex. And the sexual energy is a very powerful energy. And often it is misused, misunderstood, misquoted, and mistaken. And sex energy is a powerful energy for creativity. You'll notice that a lot of people who are very creative have a high sex drive. And there are ways to transform and transmute that into a healthy state, into a healthy place. And we happen to be able to share those things. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later in the show. And one of the things about energy and sex is that I wouldn't be doing this energy work had it not been for a radio show that was talking about how to ha give a woman an orgasm without touch. Okay, yes, I was intrigued and thought, okay, there's got to be something here. So that got me interested in learning more about how energy applies to everything. And it's been over 15 years in this journey of understanding how energy applies to every single thing in our lives, our thoughts, our feelings, our fears, our worries, our relationships, our spirituality, our businesses. That's really where I started uh, using energy and the understanding and deep principles of energy management. And also how it relates to our relationships and sex and how it plays in to every facet of our life. And as you become more masterful of your energy, then you do become more masterful of your life. And you won't allow lots of different energies to push you or to pull you or to take you in directions that otherwise you wouldn't normally go. And one of the things we talk a lot about in our workshops is how to be in your own egg, meaning your own energy bubble. And a lot of students and clients and, and people who write in say, God, I want to be able to stay in my own bubble. How do I do that? And there are ways to do that. And it's not so complicated, believe it or not. So when you learn how to master your energy and you learn how to master your life because you're masterful of your energy, then what happens is you are able to manage, master, and deal with your own bubble and still have fun out there in the world. You don't have to be at the whim of somebody else's thoughts, feelings, emotions, or energies, which is what we tend to do more often than we know. So one of the things that is really common here in Southern California is driving on the freeway. And one of the things that happens when we drive on the freeway is, is we're bombarded with other people's energies. So no matter where you are in the world, if you're in, in a fray of people, a lot of people's energies, you can be bombarded by that. And the key is to learn and understand how to keep yourself within your egg, your sacred egg of energy, regardless of what's going on outside of you. And our car is a great vehicle. It's a great opportunity to use that as a metaphor for being in our own egg. Now, the key is to be able to drive the egg, drive the self, to having management and ability to be unaffected or less affected by others' energies on the freeway. 
in other people's cars. So if somebody's raging at their partner or yelling in their car or upset about something going on at work or at home or just because there are so many people on the freeway, we want to be able to be in our own car and be happy and content and be quiet if we want to be quiet or singing and joyful. And so that's what energy mastery is all about. Today's guest is a return guest. And we had a lot of fun with him the first time, oh, about a year ago. His name's Brad Warner. And this book he's written is called Sex, Sin, and Zen. Not really. But it is Sex, Sin, and Buddha. And Brad and I are going to explore a lot of topics uh, that you'll really want to listen into and how it, his book really goes into the depths of everything from a Buddhist prostitute, a Buddhist uh, pole dancer, and a Buddhist who is doing all kinds of different things that we otherwise might not think Buddhism uh, or somebody who practiced Buddhism does. So join us in a moment. This is Siobhan Moran. This is Master Your Energy, Master Your Life. And you can find us at SiobhanMoran.com. Come visit us. Send me an email directly at author, A-U-T-H-O-R, at SiobhanMoran.com. Or give me a shout out on Facebook and tell me you heard it here on the radio. Be back in a moment. Hi, this is Siobhan Moran, and this is Master Your Energy, Master Your Life. And I was mentioning earlier that we have a return guest who was with us for his book, and it was called Zen Wrapped in Karma Dipped in Chocolate. And it was a fun interview. And so he's written another book, and I love the colors on it. And the book is called Sex, Sin, and Zen, A Buddhist Exploration of Sex from Celibacy to Polyamory and Everything in Between. And our guest is Brad Warner. So welcome, Brad. Good, good, uh, good morning. Yeah, good day. <laughs> we got a time difference here. So yeah, exactly. Who did the artwork? Did you do the artwork on the cover? Because i got to tell you, it's pretty stunning, and it's very, it's very all over the map. I love the, I love the Buddha with the guitar and the wild hair and the girls in tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's my friend Alex Wald did it, and he's, a, he's an artist based in Chicago, and, and we've been friends for years. He did, when I used to work for this uh, Japanese monster film company called Tsuburaya Productions, Alex did some artwork for us, uh, illustrating some of our pamphlets and things like that. And so I've known him for a while. And I, I actually, the uh, a, a friend of mine who was at the San Francisco Zen Center gave me a poster a couple of years ago that was for some kind of medication, probably a narcotic medication advertised in China in around the turn of the century, like early 1900s. And it, it, the, the ad showed this monk surrounded by beautiful half-naked women, and it was supposed to be, the, the message of the ad was supposed to be how calm this medication would keep you, <laughs> you know? The, so this, this monk is not even reacting, even though there's all these, these hot women around. <laughs> so I showed Alex that, uh, that picture, and, and uh, he based his artwork mainly on that. Oh, that's great. Well, I like it. It's very catchy, and it's certainly not what you would think uh, Buddhism would be affiliated with. And when I was thinking about it earlier today, I was like, you know, I don't know that many people have touched on the subject of, you know, Buddhism and sex and sin, and I think you've done something no one else has done. Not that I have seen. Have you, have you noticed anyone else doing anything like it? No, not much. There has been a couple of actually pretty good books about the history of monastic Buddhism in Asia as it relates to the regulations regarding what monks could and couldn't do sexually. And there, there have been a couple of good books. There's this one called The Red Thread, and there's one called Lust for Enlightenment. Mm. But they kind of stop. And that was a frustrating thing for me. They kind of stop at, at the uh, Meiji Restoration in Japan, which is kind of a key moment in Buddhist history in which the Japanese government did away with 
the rules, there were actually laws on the books in Japan forbidding, among other things, marriage for monks or e- even forbidding monks to eat meat. You know, this was actually a law. And that was a law by the government? Yeah, yeah, it was a government wow. law. Wow. And when and when the government did away with these laws, I suppose the the temples and the monks themselves had the choice whether to follow the the law, you know, follow the monastic rules anyway as they had been or or actually hadn't been. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a whole other <laughs> area. Um or or just give it up and most of them chose to give it up and that changed uh Buddhism uh, radically in Japan. Wow. So and 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 the the frustrating thing for me just to uh, get into that was that uh, most of these books kind of stopped there, and you're like, "Well, okay, well, what happened?" <laughs> you know, what so happened what happened next? next? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and um, and there actually is a good book about what happened next in Japan. But what I wanted to know is what happened. What what are contemporary Buddhists doing? Because I've been struggling with this all of my Buddhist life because I started studying Zen when I was about 18 years old. So it was, you know. Sex is a big deal when you're 18. Boy, no kidding. I mean, you have a, you have a whole lot of things going through your system, and everybody else is doing many different explorations. And right. then, and then on top of it, you yourself, you're involved. You know, you're involved in a completely different type of. Uh, you know, you're involved in punk music, and I'm yeah. sure that has a different connotation as well. So it must oh, have been sure. confusing. Yeah, sure. I mean, there was there were these. In the segment of the punk scene I was involved in, there was a very strong idea of morality, which I guess is not doesn't run through all of punk rock, but it's it's part of the the scene that we had. But it was sort of kind of loose. You know, mm-hmm. we didn't really you know we had this idea that you should behave morally, you should treat people well, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there wasn't any specific rules. And then when it came to sex, it was just free for all, you know, <laughs> whatever you could get. Um, but I thought, and when I encountered Buddhism, I, I encountered this rule that that's one of the, the ten major precepts, grave precepts as they call them, which says do not misuse sexuality. Well, but that's, that's the, but that's um, you know, I, I have two questions on that. One, well, how did how did you go? How did you get into Buddhism? To uh, at such a young age, and and then the second one, and is that. Um, what were there any teachings that were communicated to you early on about sex, or w- you were just learning the basics of Buddhism? Well, I was mainly learning the basics of Buddhism. I got involved in it because I, I was very interested in this whole matter of God and and spirituality and all that when I was young, but I didn't really have a basis uh, because I wasn't raised religious hmm. at all. And so it was kind of up to me to figure it out. And I happened to take a class at, in, in Kent State University called Zen Buddhism. That's hmm. all, you know. And and it just changed my whole perspective. I, I thought, this is amazing. This is, it related well to the punk rock thing because it was very much about questioning everything. Wow. You know, that's a g- punk that's rock a g- sort of. That's a really unique correlation, questioning everything. And that that's smart. Well, yeah, and, and that's what uh, what I was impressed with in Buddhism was that here was a religion that would question itself. I'd never come across that. Every mm-hmm. religion kind of stops at its own solutions. They, the, the ones I've been kind yeah. of... Yeah, well, they say, do as I say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, you know, I, I don't say this goes for every religion in right. the whole world, but every one that I'd encounter sort of goes, you know, up to a point, and then you've got your answers, and then you, you're not supposed to... You know, some of them are very adamant that you must not ever question these answers yeah. uh, whereas Buddhism was just questioning its own its own philosophy which mm. I thought how, how can they do this they're <laughs> not they're not afraid to to say okay here's what we say but you have to examine this and and see if it works for yourself well you know that's really interesting because that that's why I ended ended up in energy medicine because uh, my teacher, the first, the first thing they say out of their mouth is, you know, I, I may give you the information, however, you have to experiment on your own to find out, one, if it's true, two, if you believe it, and three, if it's going to work for you. And I think that's a great way to approach it. And I was hooked. <laughs> I was really hooked because that made logical sense to me. 
Wow, how cool is that? So we have a lot to talk about with your book because you cover some topics that mostly people don't talk about. They don't talk about it and they don't write about it. And you put it all in one great big, <laughs> one, one great big, it's not huge, but you put it all in one big place. And yeah. so um, talk a little bit about where we started, which is um, Buddhism. And most people, I think, maybe don't realize they think this is that they probably believe that Buddhism is about celibacy. Well, yeah. <coughs> and there's a, um, there is a basis for believing that uh, because the earliest Buddhist monks were celibate and in fact even to this day throughout most of Asia Buddhist monks tend to follow a rule of celibacy and as I said earlier that rule kind of was has disappeared in, in Japanese Buddhism for 150 years or so it, it just hasn't been the case so it's a relatively new tradition even in Japan to, to, to have non-celibate monks. But the, the other side of that, though, is the rules of celibacy were only for monks, and for and I include female monks in that. I hate the word nun. But <laughs> <anyway>. <laughs> I do, um, too. <laughs> so so it, was for, it was for monks bo of both sexes were supposed to be celibate, but for lay people, there, there, there weren't any, any specific rules. I think there were... Somewhere in the book, and I wish I could, you know, pop it out of my mouth right up, right up here. But there were like four uh, guidelines for what was acceptable sexually. I remember one was, uh, and these were all sort of male centric, but you could you could extend them for women as well. But the the one was don't have sex with a woman who is under the care of her parents or uh, mentally ill, <laughs> you know, um, a, a prisoner, female prisoners. Uh, there were there were these these were, then those were the rules for for lay people, you know, and un the under the care of the parents thing is sort of their way of you know saying don't have sex with a minor, yeah, don't have sex with a minor, yeah, wow. Yeah, but theirs wasn't to specify an age. They just said you know under the care of the parents. That's interesting. But, um, and and there were there were there were a couple rules kind of along those lines, but they're very general. Huh. So you know you're kind of left with this wide field of. <laughs> of everything else. Yeah. And that's where, you know, that's where you, you, you wonder. Yeah. I wonder. I, I think you did great covering it and talking about it and exploring it. And then and then you move into um, sex and the Bodhisattva vow. Now, mo a lot of people don't know what the Bodhisattva vow is. And Paramedis, our, our uh, technology that we teach for the energy healing, is, is aligned with the Bodhisattva. And so you're, you're exploring all the different aspects of how Buddhism and the higher elevations of the Bodhisattva re uh, relate to sex. How does that apply? Well, um, hmm. yeah, th it's, uh, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a funny thing because the idea, the Bodhisattva vow is basically says that you will save all others before you save yourself. It's sort of an altruistic idea that um, the, 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 it was created at a time when people thought Buddhism was getting a little too selfish and that the idea was, or people were mistaking that the idea of Buddhism was to save yourself and, you know, I never heard it. Else. I never heard it expressed like that, save others before yourself. I thought it was to, you know, help save others. Huh, interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and you're supposed to, so, so how do you do that? And I think in, th there's all kinds of nuts and bolts things that go beyond this, but since the book was about sex, I decided, well, how do we do this in sex? And <laughs> that is to always care about whoever you're involved with. And that, that you know, in these days, I get a lot of younger people sort of interested in my in my work, as you you know probably guess from the covers and things, mm -hmm. and and I wonder if if our society is going a little bit in a funny direction in that way because people are very casual about sex, and I I don't even say you can't you know I'm not I'm not even going in the book saying you you must not ever have a one night stand and you must not ever do this and that, but um, even in cases where something like that happens, you have to. Uh, be aware that what you're you are getting involved with is something very deep, uh, and it doesn't. It, I got in trouble. I was writing for the Suicide Girls website, which is you know <laughs> sort of soft core um, 
they don't like to call it porn, so <laughs> I wouldn't say that. But, you know, it's a sort of a sexy website. Yeah. And, and I was writing for it, and, and they would let me write anything I wanted. And I put an article there where I questioned this idea that there could be such a thing as no strings attached sex. Yeah, and that was the next chapter, attached non-attachment. Yeah, and, and a lot of people got really upset about that article, a lot of, you know, because they want to believe in this. And, I, you know, I'm not saying you can't, you know, and obviously you can have sex with somebody and never see them again or never have any sort of commitment. Uh, but um, it doesn't mean there, that something is exchanged there, you know, and it's more than just bodily fluids. Yeah, there's an energy. We, yeah, there's an yeah. energy. Yeah, yeah, and that's what we, we kind of forget right. or you know, because we live in this sort of, sort of steeped in this mechanistic view of the, the universe, and we think, okay, well, just bodies are rubbing up against each other, and that's, you know, and, and that's no big deal. But it, it's more than that, and, and I think we need to come back and, and understand that. And understanding that, you can still have uh, plenty of fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think it's important to understand that. But and, you're not, and you're saying, you know, honor, yeah. just have a lot of honor. Yeah. Yeah, you need to be careful. I mean, I could kind of almost sum up the philosophy of the book in that sentence. You, you just, just be careful. It, Buddhism, you know, there are different Buddhist sects that have different views on what is and isn't acceptable sexually, and some of them will be happy to tell you. But my understanding has always been that it isn't the specific act that you do or who you do it with or, you know, how many times a day or whatever, you know, any of this stuff. Um, it's it's more the the approach that you you take when you do it you you um, and that's a simple thing you know and everybody kind of should know it but we forget it uh, mm -hmm. very easily mm -hmm. uh, and yeah I we've become very throwaway yeah and it's one of those things you you can remind people of a thousand times and it's still it's still important yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk more about all of this when we get back. This is Siobhan Moran. This is Master Your Energy, Master Your Life, and we're talking with Brad Warner. And we're talking about his new book, Sex, Sin, and Zen. And there's a lot of stuff we really need to uncover, so join us in a moment. You can find us at SiobhanMoran.com, or you can find us on Facebook at SiobhanOM, or you can find us on Twitter at Siobhan. See you in a moment. Hi, welcome back. This is Siobhan Moran. This is Master Your Energy, Master Your Life. And today we're talking about the all-important subject. And that all-important subject is sex because we use it, we have it, we need it, we want it, we yearn for it, um, we look for partners with it, and there's an energy associated with it. And our guest today is Brad Warner, and he's written a wonderful book um, the cover alone, along with each of the different chapters, is really de deals with everything from porno to, uh, to karma, to marriage advice, to, um, to paying for it. it. It just goes all over, and it's, you know, I mean, you're really just honest. Are these all of your musings, Brad, of just things that you've come across when you've been out there teaching? Well, part, partly it's, it's that, and partly it's how I've kind of grown up with Buddhism and, and sex. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, one of the other things I tried to do was I didn't want it to be my voice alone because I thought it was too important of a topic to just be to one guy yeah. you know, telling his opinion. So I talked to some people who had experiences that I uh, couldn't uh, fathom, you yeah. know, the main one being that everybody seems to be talking about is Nina Hartley, who's a porn star, right. who uh, grew up in a Buddhist household uh, with, uh, with parents who were monks. Uh, and, you know, I talked to a, a friend of mine who's a, a gay Buddhist practitioner in San Francisco, because I'm not gay, so I don't know what that experience is. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to uh, another friend of mine who had, uh, who's been dealing with the repercussions of childhood sexual abuse in, in her Buddhist practice. And, and I thought that was an important thing to let her uh, speak about that without any interference. For me and another uh, friend of mine who'd gone through an abortion, and I know I can't really talk about that because I can give you my, you know, gas bag opinion about it, but you know, <laughs> it doesn't. It's it, it's not really right. You know, the the important thing. The important thing is to talk to somebody who's gone through that, and she's a Buddhist and and she's a practitioner, and she talks about how that affected uh, her life and. So I tried to give 
as much of, as possible a kind of overview of the the, the Buddhist scene as it as it stands in early 21st century America and Europe, in my observation of it. Mm, I, I think you did it. I think you did a fantastic and a fun job. And something that caught my attention, because uh, I have somebody in my practice who is dealing with this, is the polyamory. So yeah. t- tell tell our listeners about that, because I don't think most people know about it. I certainly didn't before I had a client. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's kind of a newly emerging uh, way of looking at, at sexuality in which people try to practice, you know, it's what they call open relationships and, and things like that, where they'll have more than one sexual partner. Uh, sometimes there's a limited number, you know, there's like, you know, it's like a group of five people or something like that, or, or sometimes it's just completely open. But the, the idea being that the reason using the word polyamory instead of just you know, saying, you know, what free love or something right. is, is to suggest that there is a basis of being committed as much as, as you can be to to more than one person being open and honest. And my, I mean, my feeling about the whole thing is, is somewhat skeptical, uh, but I, I wanted to allow people who practice that, for example, Nina Hartley, to just say their piece because... Uh, it is it is something that's emerging and something that's kind of becoming socially important. Uh, there seems now. to be a lot of it. I, like I said, I'd never heard of it, and I I was very surprised to learn. You know, I, th- this particular person has varying views of what they're up to. Some days it includes sex, and some days it doesn't, and some days just it, it's very interesting how it just. I think it goes from whatever wants to be defined at the moment. Yeah, and and I I wonder how people uh manage that. Uh it 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 seems to me to be a very complicated situation and and it there's also when I've read some of the literature about it it seems to be very kind of idealistic in in that I don't know how uh it, it's a lot about what how things ought to be uh rather than how things actually are. So, but uh, you know, but at the same time, I'm not repudiating, repudiating it or saying it's wrong or evil or anything. It's just I have a certain amount of uh, skepticism about it. Mm-hmm. But but still, it's it's something that it, it's something that I see our society is kind of moving in that direction. You know, you really? Well, I don't know if we're moving towards a polyamorous direction, but we're moving in a direction where people are more accepting of a variety of approaches to to sexuality. It's don't you think so that people are more polarized cuz I don't know, I hear I hear more people that I hear more people that are waiting to have sex until they're first married and then the whole other opposite end of the spectrum. There's not a lot of gray area is what I'm seeing more well, of. No, that you you're right about that. There is a lot of uh, polarization and I think part of that is because a lot of these uh, things that were once closeted are starting to become out in the open. So, whereas you know people might have had you know more or less the same feelings before, they weren't exposed to it. Mm-hmm. So nobody knew you know that this was even an option. Uh, you know, and and so what do we do about that? How do we deal with a society that's that's like that? And you know, my my feeling is, if you're going to follow a Buddhist path, your best bet is to keep your life as uncomplicated as possible, and, and something like having multiple sexual partners is going to complicate things, mm-hmm. uh, which doesn't mean, you know, one of the big things in the that I talk about in the book is the lack of an idea of sin in Buddhism. So there's no sin in doing that. There's no, like, it's not uh, against God or against Buddha. It's just something when you throw that, it, it's practical. When you throw that much complication into your life, well, you're going you're gonna to have some, some kind of repercussions for that. So don't, don't head into this thinking that you're not going to, that things are not going to get messy because they'll, they'll get messy. Mm-hmm. I, that's, and that's why they're in the practice. Because <laughs> yeah. we're dealing with that very issue. So, yeah, right. thanks for bringing that up because that's very, it, it, Buddhism, any spiritual practice is about being more uh, fulfilled with fewer 
distractions. Yeah, and that's that's the idea of it. And and it, you know, and also if you're going to get into that sort of thing, expect it to make things complicated and expect it to affect you. Yeah. Yeah, boy, no kidding. I think people miss. You know, they're like, oh, let's just do this. And, <laughs> you know, and then when it when it gets all weird and and crazy, then they're they're wondering why. And it's like, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, th this goes along with, I think, people's idea of what Tantra is. A lot of people yeah. think that Tantra is, is similar to what we're describing. And I think there are two, uh, two, uh, two schools of Tantra. Um, right. Talk a little bit about what you learned about that. Well, I'm not a, a practitioner of tantric Buddhism at all, you know, and so what I know about it is what I've read in books. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, a lot of, you know, a lot of what's being... There's a sort of commercialized, I don't know if it's commercialized, but it's sort of very sexy in the in a way to to imagine that you can have your your sexual uh, sex can be a meditation meditative practice, and that does exist within some of the tantric Buddhist lines, although not all of them. Mm -hmm. And so people are kind of fascinated by that, and they want to jump into that. What they forget, and what gets neglected, is that these approaches to making sex, a spiritual practice, these were things that people would work at for decades before they actually got in the bedroom and tried them out. Thank you for saying well that. Grounded. Thank you for saying that, because I, I think that people want to go into a workshop and then and then practice from there. Yeah, and that's the problem. I mean, these pe you know, you were talking about an ancient uh, society of people who would practice for decades with their, with their meditation and then uh, try out uh, the sexual aspect based on years and years of, of, a, of meditation practice that didn't have any, uh, you know, was often celibate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so what's being kind of uh, trotted out these days by people who kind of want to make a <laughs> some, some money quickly is, uh, is, hey, just go right into it. And that's, and, you know, and maybe that's fun and whatever. I don't, you know, again, I'm not like saying, oh, you can't do that. But just don't, don't think you're getting the same thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, that's the mistake, mm -hmm. is, to, is to imagine it's, that it's the same, to, to just, you know, why can't we just jump into this the, the first day? I mean, eh, you know. <laughs> Takes a little bit more understanding of energy than that. <laughs> yeah. So well, now you you um, talk about uh, Jap Japanese culture a lot. You live there. And right. you've done, if I recall correctly, you've done some comic book work and some, you know, some wonderful uh, imagery. And so the Japanese have a different idea, at least that's what we Americans think anyway, most Americans think, of sex. Is that true? Yeah, it was very interesting for me when I got over there because there, there were, it was like little things were cluing me in to the fact that I was now dealing with a society that had a radically different view of what was and wasn't acceptable sexually. and. And, and I considered myself, I came out of the punk rock scene, I'd seen it all and done it all, I figured. <laughs> I was in my late 20s, I got over to Japan, and even after all that experience, I was a little taken aback by some of the stuff I saw and how openly, uh, th there's no, sex isn't sort of closeted away in Japan. Nudity, you know, is, is, is acceptable on a, on a level that we find kind of shocking and uh, you know, one of the things I pointed out in the in the book is going into a video store and seeing the sexy videos, not necessarily the porn videos. They're in the back room, just like we have here, but the kind of R-rated sexy videos, just on the low shelves in the in the video store. And I never even thought about that, but we put them always on the high shelves because we don't want the children to see them. And in Japan, it didn't matter. You know, if if children saw pictures of naked people or, or even pictures of naked people in hot embrace and stuff like that it was it was not uh, shocking hmm. and and I didn't even realize that I had the you know had the capacity to be shocked by that I would have <laughs> thought I was beyond that but it was the, the conditioning was so deeply ingrained yeah and wow. to see that there was a functioning society that could exist without that was kind of eye-opening yeah 
Well, you know, I mean, not only that you can see in movies that they they share that, uh, you know, sex is open in diff many different ways. Um, however, it seems to be closeted in other ways that we don't have it closeted here in the United States. Sure. So sure. it's kind of a lot of a, a lot of m a lot more mystery, but a lot more openness. It's kind of this really interesting contrast to me. Yeah, it lets you know, though. I think the main thing is it's it, it's like it's interesting to see that there's a whole other way mm -hmm. uh, to deal with it, and and that that I feel like the, a lot of what uh, goes on in Japan is based on the idea that there's no there's no concept of sexual sin at all in mm. Japan. Mm. So so that just changes the whole the whole playing field, you know, right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, w and when we come back in a moment, we're going to have more. This is fascinating topic. This is Siobhan Moran, and we're talking with Brad Warner. And you can find us at SiobhanMoran.com. We'll have links to his website on there. And we'll see you in a moment. Hi, welcome back. This is Siobhan Moran. This is Master Your Energy, Master Your Life, and today we're mastering sex energy. Okay, well, not all sex energy, <laughs> but energy of sex is important, and if you do it, if you understand energy and sex appropriately, then what happens is something beautiful, and Brad's written a wonderful book called Sex, Sin, and Zen, and you explore so many things, Brad, here. I love it. Um, did it uh, did it take you to places that you were surprised at when you were writing? Well, yeah, I felt like I I needed a kind of a deeper understanding in order to write this book. So I wanted to see some things I I wouldn't normally have taken a look at, and you know, a lot of it stemmed from first getting uh, the job writing for Suicide Girls, this uh, you know, soft core website. And, and getting to know some of the people involved in that and getting to know some of the people involved in the, the S&M scene in Los Angeles, you know, sort of through those connections. And I was really surprised because one of the people I met was a very committed Buddhist practitioner in one of the Tibetan uh, Buddhist schools. Hmm. And, uh, and, and seeing that there was a whole the whole spectrum and, and that a lot of these a lot of the people who were interested in Buddhism and doing this sort of work were, were kind of like oh you know I feel like I'm doing bad or <laughs> something um, so I wanted to see see where that where that came from and how people were were uh, dealing with these things in you know in a in, in in reality rather than sitting around and and speculating on what it might be like. Hmm. I don't think that speculation is too valuable. You couldn't have gone to the places you've gone in the book if you had been sitting <laughs> and speculating or, or just exploring from from your own mind and having interactions with people. But I think the real interactions are, ma are what makes it very intriguing to, to want to find out more about what you've discovered. And, and so in your own, in your own uh, teaching practice, how do you teach about sex and sin and no sin and h how do you sh how do you gently share that when you teach well i usually try to allow it to kind of come up and then respond so i wouldn't uh you know i've been kind of toying with the idea of doing seminars on on buddhism and sexuality mm -hmm. based on the book but i haven't done anything like that you know where you deliberately okay say set up this this is the topic we're going to yeah. talk about right now uh, usually it just kind of comes up, and and one of the reasons I wrote uh, the book is that that the subject of sex kept coming up, and it kept being something that people wanted to know about. And I'd heard from other Buddhist teachers that it came up for them as well. So and 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 I think and I say this right in I think maybe within the first three pages of the book that I don't I'm not trying to speak for all of Buddhism, and I tried to allow some contrasting views in there. I, I'm, I'm hoping Noah Levine, for example, will forgive me for, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I quoted him in a book and, and then said, well, I don't really agree with what he's saying here, you know, which doesn't mean to say that I think he's got a bad opinion or he's wrong. Mm -hmm. it's just, um, I see it a little bit differently and I wanted to, uh, to express that. You know, and a, a lot of people in the Buddhist world tend to slide towards the conservative scale sexually, and I think that 
that makes sense. Oh, but can I, let's to stop for there a second, because sure. yes and no, I don't know. I, I would say outwardly they say conservative. However, some of the things I've heard have really surprised me. Well, yeah, that's true. What I was going to say is that there's a certain conservatism, but not, not like a thou shalt not do this sort of conservatism, but, but it comes from a practice of trying to simplify your own life. Um, and when you do that, what's, what's the simplest thing? My teacher, I, I quote this in the book, told me that he thinks that a Buddhist monk should either be celibate or monogamously married. Uh, and I, find, I found myself in a situation a few years ago where, where I wasn't. I, you know, my marriage fell apart, and I was left with this you know, big gap, and I was not ready to say, okay, I'm going to be celibate, you know, and, and I, I kind of think he was right in a way, uh, that I think my teacher was right. I think I would have been uh, more even keeled if I had taken that option, but I didn't. Mm. And I don't think uh, a lot of Buddhist practitioners are ready for the, the celibacy option, and I don't think you should try to be celibate if you're not uh, specifically inclined to, because it's going to cause more problems than it's going to solve, and that's what I felt like in my case. Well, and energetically, it creates a uh, it creates an imbalance, and it makes the you know kind of like makes the sh sex chakra uh, vibrate louder. And all you're going to do is you're going to attract more people to it. I mean, there is somebody that we we used to have uh, late night discussions at two o'clock in the morning about this very topic. And as the, as the chakras get bigger and clearer, then you become more magnetic. And one of the chakras that becomes bigger and clearer when you happen to be working on energy and, and, and clarity and peace and, and, what, and all of those different things of spirituality is the sex chakra. And what's going to happen is you're going to be attractive to others of the opposite sex uh, a lot more than you might have ordinarily been. And... Um, uh, yeah, I've definitely heard from people who, who practice with celibacy that that very same thing. And I suspect that's why they they tell or or want monks to be celibate, so that because their sex chakra is so big that it's going to attract somebody and it's definitely going to take them away from from that clarity of path, etc. Yeah, and you know it depends what you want, and it also. You know, like I like I said, that you, you, a lot of us aren't aren't up for that option. Yes. My own teacher, he said, he he actually decided to become celibate in I think his late fifties or something like that. And as far as I know, he's maintained it. I I don't know. I don't ask. But there are some but, that don't. <laughs> but yeah, but he he also said that somebody said, well, could you have taken such a vow earlier in his life? And he was like, kind of got a little bit loud and said, absolutely not. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And and I thought, well, that's great. That's that's honest. That is honest. Because you just have a little bit too much stuff, you know, running around your system, and it's just, you know, and and you shouldn't you shouldn't go there if it's just the, the idea is to cause fewer problems. And if and if celibacy becomes a problem, then it's not helping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's just it's becoming the problem. problem. Exactly. Yeah. You know, one of the things you talk about in the book, and I wanted to talk, I wanted to chat about this because I liked your opinion on it. Was the hug is the drug about the hugging saints? Mm -hmm. So tell a little bit about that because I really like what you had to say. Well, you know, I, I, I tried very hard to be uh, to be careful and not diss uh, the the woman I was talking about because I think she does some good work in the world, and the, and there's nothing so terrible about it. But uh, but you but do have a different opinion. <laughs> yeah, but it seemed to me that the the whole point of the exercise was to try to find this place of pure love, and and a lot of spirituality tends to go that direction, and and it. it I remember my teacher saying something which made me incredibly angry when I first heard him say it. He said, "In order to to have the." the Buddhist practice, you need to have a balance of love and hate. And mm. I was like, what? What are you talking about? Hate? Come on! <laughs> but but hate is something a little little deeper. You know, hate doesn't have to manifest itself in horrible actions. You know, it doesn't have to manifest as, as racism and, and killing and war and death and all this atrocity. It's, 
it's kind of a natural part of what it is to be to be a human being. There are some things in life that you uh, are attracted to and, and want and, and can you know deal with and, and love, and there's some things that you hate. Uh, but you have to. But if you can learn to to make peace with your hatred, it doesn't have to manifest itself in anything bad. It's just an honesty uh, that that I hate that, and therefore I'm 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 you know separating myself a little bit from that. Or or the hate becomes a, a kind of a way of acknowledging. You know, sometimes sometimes love becomes a, a kind of a hateful love in which you're you're trying to destroy everything that is against love. Know, and and it and 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 also the other the other side of that is love tends to be very soft and and supple and warm and and cozy and cuddly and, and all that good stuff, but it, it's also very it's also very weak uh, in in some respects. Really? Uh, well, weak in the I don't know. You you know, these, it's hard to clarify these terms. I think love is very powerful, but it's but the what I'm what I'm talking about here is that that sort of you know, one of the other things I talked about is this singer that I went and saw who was, you know, singing all about love and peace and wonderfulness, and 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 it was the sort of big love vibe in the room, but it all had to do with our love vibe is going to destroy you. <laughs> you know, and I and I thought, and I thought, well, is that really loving? You know, you. So so it's a it's it's a way of of using that that sense of separation that we do honestly feel and making that into something that's not evil or destructive. Uh, so, you know, that the word hate is a kind of an unfortunate word because it sort of uh, gives you this image of, of Hitler and, you know, all these terrible things. But it doesn't have to go that direction. It can go a direction where it's balanced, where you are acknowledging both that which you accept and that which you don't accept, and even those things that you don't accept, you're not out to destroy them. Yeah, it's you just two sides of the coin. If the yeah. more you have two sides of the coin, the more you're going to be harmonious inside. Ra yeah. Rather than because if you suppress one, then then you're going to be in. There's going to be too much in the. Yeah, the when you're denying your hatred, that's you know. <laughs> Well, yeah, because it well, and it's it's a universal law because it re universal law refuses to allow imbalance. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I believe that. I mean, and balance is one of the things we often talk about in in Buddhist practice uh, as being one of the key factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, yeah, I love what you did. I love how you put it together. It you know each chapter is short. It's to the point, and you have a wonderful, healthy skepticism about all of this. So thank you for doing that and bringing that to light for a lot of folks. I think it's going to be uh, kind of a, an awakening for them if they were to get the book, and I hope they do. Uh, are you book signing anywhere? Well, I'm going to New York in mid-October. It's October oh, is it 15th or 16th. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, to do some to do a signing at, at the Interdependence Project and some other uh, bookstores over there, and I'm going to be up in Montreal as well. And all of the dates I put a link on my website that has this updated uh, constantly. And where do they find that? And that's uh, hardcorezen.blogspot.com, and there's a link there. If you go to the left side, it says Brad's 2010 tour or something like that. Right. Right. Well, Brad, I am grateful that you were here again. I certainly enjoy having you and your different twist on life and getting people out of their comfort zone and thinking for themselves. <laughs> so thanks, thanks for doing that. And I look forward to your next book. I don't know what it's going to be about. I'm not going to ask because then it would, be, uh, it would be revealing the punchline, I'm sure. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, so uh, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. That was Brad Warner, and this is Siobhan Moran. This is Master Your Energy, Master Your Life, and really understand that sex energy is a powerful energy. You can use it for good, or you can use it for not good. And we choose to use it for good here and share some information that might not otherwise be available to you or 
get you to think about sex energy in a completely new way. You don't have to have it completely one way or the other. You don't have to be completely celibate. You don't have to be completely amorous with everyone. Uh, and just because you may not be having physical sex doesn't mean that there is not an energy happening. I know, ladies, you can feel that. And men, you can feel that, too. Because energy is everything. You can feel when somebody is attracted to you. That is a sex energy. It may not be a physical sex and a closeness of it, but you can feel it. You can feel when somebody is thinking of you in an inappropriate way. That is sex energy. And when we choose to learn how to use it in a proper way for creativity, for beauty, for procreation, for a healthy, honorable uh, way of thinking about or being with another person, then what we have is we have an amazing, powerful energy that is very creative for our life, for our life force, for our relationships. So when you don't have sex or you are not close with somebody, then you tend to have pent up energy. And that pent up energy can lead to various things that create problems, difficulties, issues. And we see that in a lot of spiritual practices or a lot of religions. And without naming them specifically, uh, we just want to share with you that there is a way to transmute it, transform it, and have healthy sex energy in your life, physically, mentally, emotionally, and creatively. And for more on some of these topics and the Energy Mastery courses that we teach and share, and our latest book, Learn to Meditate in Two Minutes for the Lazy, Crazy, and Time Deficient, you want to go to SiobhanMoran.com and you want to click on Products. And you want to check us out so that you can find some of our amazing, amazing products that we have been sharing with the world for the past several years. We have a CBS2 did a, an interview with me, and you can actually check that out on SiobhanMoran.com. To be perfectly honest, I haven't really watched it because I don't really like watching myself, so... Let me know what you think when you watch it. And uh, have some fun this week. And until next time, have a beautiful, healthy energy, physically, mentally, emotionally, and sexually. This is Siobhan Moran. This is Master Your Energy, Master Your Life. Namaste, namaste, namaste. Thank you for joining us today for Master Your Energy, Master Your Life. You can hear more shows by clicking the Archives button, and you can learn more about energetic principles at SiobhanMoran.com. That's S-H-E-E-B-A-U-N, Moran, M-O-R-A-N.com. We'll see you again next week.